Today on Travelogue, we visit the capital of overseas Chinese, the city of Jiangmen. Discover with us the distinctive architectural marvels known as Diaolou in the second episode of our 10-part series along southern China's Pearl River. The Pearl River, known in Chinese as the Zhujiang, with its eastern, western and northern tributaries, it's actually a vast river system, the third longest river in China, and the second largest by volume. And right at its mouth, on the South China Sea, lies fascinating Jiangmen. G'day, and welcome back to our Pearl River series. In this second episode, we're going to be continuing our journey upstream through the Pearl River system, and we're going to be going along the West River, which is a tributary of the Pearl River itself. Now, to be more specific, we're on the banks of the Pearl River, which is another branch of the whole web of waterways that make up the Pearl River system. And you know what? Where there's water, there's always life. And so life goes on here, in the south-central part of Guangdong province, about equidistant from Guangzhou and Macau. To be honest, the place doesn't seem so extraordinary until you really get to know it. This is Jiangmen. It's also known as the city of overseas Chinese. And in fact, this is the homeland of more than three and a half million Chinese diaspora. There's a visible collision of both cultures, Chinese and foreign, but that's just the surface. It runs much deeper than that. <laughs> Jiangmen is one of the largest of the nine mainland prefectures that make up the Pearl River Delta metropolitan region. It's a growing megalopolis that's one of the most densely urbanized regions in the world, as well as a leading commercial hub and major manufacturing center. But that depiction doesn't really tally with this captivating countryside scenery at all, does it? This is what makes this place even more remarkable. But what are these peculiar buildings? Certainly not skyscrapers. I've come to Zili village in Tangkou township to check out part of what was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2007. The Kaiping Diaolou and villages. Diaolou refer to the fortified residential watchtowers found in this region, made of stone, brick or reinforced concrete. They were built starting in the Ming Dynasty around the mid-1500s, right up until the first half of the 20th century, reaching a peak in the 1920s and 30s. What makes them extra special is the complex and often flamboyant fusion of Chinese and Western architecture and design. Many Diaolo have been locked up and abandoned but some welcome in the tourists. Walking into these premises is like entering a time machine. The interiors are a little worn and weathered, but authentic. While Diaolo were originally built as defenses against constant bandit raids, during the late 19th century and early 20th century, they also served as residences, like this one. Its top floor boasts a typical, highly elaborate ancestral shrine a demonstration of the family's fortune, which was, like so many other Kaiping natives, accumulated overseas. But of course, with wealth comes the worry of how to protect it. You know these metal sheets and bars were shipped all the way from Germany. They were pretty serious about their safety, weren't they? You might think that there's no escape from a place like this, especially when there's a fire or you know, something like that. But actually, there is. There's an emergency exit. It's kind of invisible. But all you need is a key and, unless you're Rapunzel, a really long length of rope. Despite the significant value as a historical repository of overseas Chinese culture, they're not overrun by visitors, even during peak season. This is definitely a good thing, but at the same time, it should be busier. 
I think that every single foreigner with Chinese heritage should see the Diaolong, given the chance. It's difficult to put into words what I feel here. Indeed, my forefathers were not from Jiangmen, but as a third generation overseas Chinese, I sense the inexplicable attraction of this place and its Diaolo, a jumble of intrigue, curiosity, and pride. And lucky me, as if it isn't sensational enough already, on this one day I've picked to drop in, Mother Nature decides to turn up the theatrics. I love this. And then it's over as quickly as it began. Whew, that shower was a nice break from the heat. Hey, thought I couldn't get any more drenched. I was already so slick with sweat. Anyway, Huli um, Village is well known for uh, its cluster of Diaolo. It's very condensed, and this is one of the ones that are open to the public and from which you can get a pretty good view of the other Diaolo around. I think it's a very kind of surreal landscape, isn't it, to see these strange structures kind of coming out of these paddy fields. It's beautiful. Diaolo aren't the only manifestation of east-west fusion here in Kaiping. This is Li Yuan Garden, one of the four most famous gardens in Guangdong, a manicured mixture of oriental landscaping and occidental architecture. This is the luxurious home of Xie Wei Li, creator of the garden and emigrant to the United States. To tell you the truth, I'm having a tad of trouble finding the fusion. I'm a little bit confused, in a good way, of course. I feel like I'm in some old movie set somewhere in the West, but actually, this is a businessman's house that was built about 90 years ago in southern China. But I think that's because it doesn't really look remotely Chinese at all. And even though some of the building materials were imported, like the concrete, a lot of them are actually locally sourced. And the decorations are, are done in a very Chinese kind of process. And if you look over there, that was uh, his brother's house. They had a very, very similar taste in building. And it's almost exactly the same. And if you look at the roof, sorry, it's a bit under construction, but it's distinctly Chinese with the colours and the design. And yeah, I guess the fusion isn't really that obvious, but it's still a fusion. These two buildings next to me are really special. They're kind of like a melting pot of architectural styles from all across the globe and also from different areas as well. Like, you know, there's a Middle Eastern kind of element to that one, for example. But I think the concept behind them is actually really Chinese. So on my left, we've got an aviary full of chirping birds. And on my right, there is a greenhouse full of nice smelling plants. And there's a Chinese saying, Niao Yu Hua Xiang, which literally means bird song and uh, the fragrance of flowers. And it's meant to imply a beautiful kind of natural surrounding. And I think by building these here, they've created exactly that. It's a natural paradise, isn't it? And also, an artist's paradise. Li Yuan Garden, completed in 1936, comprises 1.1 hectares of canals, corridors, bridges and pavilions, perfect for a painting. Me? I'm keeping myself busy playing I Spy. Ha! <laughs> That's pretty random, hey? But it's a perfect example of fusion design. Stuffed full of history and culture along the Pearl River, I'm getting hungry for real food. Maybe some of the popular Cantonese gastronomy. But Kaiping has its own local specialities, which feature on almost every menu here. Yay, it's dinner time! So the climate here in the south of China is really hot and humid, and the Chinese believe that that generates a lot of inner heat. But they also believe that you can kind of eliminate or at least reduce the inner heat by eating certain types of food. So the cuisine is generally a lot uh, lighter here, which I really like. But there's one thing that this place is really famous for in particular, and, well, like, Beijing has its Peking duck, 
the Kaiping people have Kaiping goose. Yay! Can't wait to get stuck into it. But no spoilers for you this time. You're just going to have to come to Jiangmen and try it for yourself. Coming up next, we find the oldest Kaiping Diaolo, the grandest Kaiping Diaolo, well, according to some, and the Kaiping Diaolo in apparently the most beautiful village in China. Whoa! The modern day Diaolo structures, they were mostly built for defense and protection, but the idea behind them had to come from somewhere, right? Now, nearby there is a Diaolo that's meant to be the oldest surviving Diaolo in Kaiping, and it was a community structure, so a lot of the villagers would have pitched in money to have it built so they could shelter in, it in times of danger. So, for example, if there were bandits around or if there was a flood, because this area is quite prone to flooding. So this mother of Diaolo, we're going to try and find it in this little village. Oop, dead end. <laughs> Where am I? I love this stuff. It's like a maze. All right. So it, it's either <laughs> I hop over that wall or uh, climb through someone's garden. Let's try over there. Where is it? <laughs> I'm looking for something that's more than 400 years old, so I'm kind of expecting a really ancient... Oh! Is that it? Bingo! I think I found it! In hindsight, I probably should have just followed the tourists. Never mind. This fortress, known as Yinglong Lo, is tucked away in the ancient village of Sanmen Li in Chikang Township. It was constructed sometime between 1522 and 1566 and renovated in 1919. These days, it's a must-see attraction for those on Jiangmen's Diaolo circuit, not because of its appearance, but for its age and repute. Plus, once snap-happy visitors start craving snacks, they don't have to look far to find these enterprising elderly residents hawking homegrown and dried fruit. It's a pretty modest looking Diaolo in comparison, right? But as a communal place of refuge, it would have been really, really effective. I mean, check out the absolute thickness of these walls. It's at least a metre, or around a metre thick. I guess it's no surprise that it's still standing today. It's super sturdy. Now, for the other less primitive end of the Diaolo spectrum, I head to Jinjiangli village in Kaiping's Xiangang township. On arrival, it's nothing too exceptional. A tiny pastoral hamlet organized in a grid of grey brick dwellings. Like so many rural settlements in China, it's home to a handful of seniors and tots while the working age generation are noticeably absent. Jinjiangli is the third village we visited, out of the four that are UNESCO World Heritage listed. It's so raw and rustic in these parts of Jiangmen, yet, almost unbelievably, so many people who started life here as poor peasants set sail overseas to Southeast Asia, Australasia and North America and amassed immense fortunes there. They came back home with new riches and new ideas, which they literally set in concrete. Entry is included in a 180 RMB combined ticket that gives access to all the main Diallo sites over two days. This one in particular shouldn't be skipped. Built in 1923 by a Hong Kong merchant, it's famed as the number one Diallo of Kaiping. Considering that approximately 1,800 Diaolo still remain standing, it's not an insignificant claim. And in my opinion, it's true. Woohoo! I made it as far as I could come. But still, it already dwarfs everything else in this area. You know, I'm not really scared of heights, but I'm kind of feeling a bit nervous. Got a bit of an adrenaline rush coming up here, being exposed to all the elements. But the view is just spectacular. I can see a lot of the villages around and all the serene green surroundings. 
This diaolo is called Rui Shi Lo, and you could say that it's the iconic diaolo. It's nine stories in height, which makes it the tallest diaolo in Kaiping. And also, people say it's the most splendid as well. You can see that there are a lot of Byzantine kind of architectural influences, especially with the domes and the columns, but it's also mixed with the Chinese. And for some reason, I know it's a little bit of an odd structure to find here, but it seems to fit perfectly into the landscape to me, almost like a puzzle piece. A very exotic puzzle piece, mind you. It does kind of steal the spotlight here, although the two neighbouring diaolo are also pretty dramatic in their own right. One, a communal refuge erected in 1918 from publicly donated funds, and the other, a residential diaolo designed by a French architect for an owner who returned from America in 1919. Fast forward almost one whole century, and things are a little more down to earth these days. <laughs> Such a free spirit. <laughs> Can I adopt you both? I'm going to take you back to Australia, okay? Oh. <laughs> Oh man, I am so confused. <laughs> I just, I, I think I'm, I'm hearing Mandarin and Cantonese and the local dialect, and my mind is just. No, my. Lucy, Lucy, the new one. So ye ye ye, so sang. Ah. Okay, so I'm having a lot of trouble understanding them, but it's still better than other places in China that I've gone to where I don't understand anything at all because it sounds kind of a little bit like Cantonese, so I can <laughs> translate from Cantonese into Mandarin and then Mandarin into English. So, <laughs> hey, <laughs> bye bye, bye bye. Mm. That's a universal language, isn't it? Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> The last of our UNESCO-listed Diaolo villages is called Ma Jianglong, located in Baihe Township. It's actually a cluster of five minuscule communities linked together by bamboo-shaded stone paths, which the local tourism bureau declares collectively to be the most beautiful village in China. Well, I mean, it could be, with its Diaolo emerging from the emeralds. It's certainly unique. In all my travel of travels, I've seen a smidgen more of China than the average person, I'd say. But even to me, the majesty and mystique of the seven diaolo and eight villas make Ma Jianglong pretty special. It's not something I expected to encounter on this Pearl River adventure. Such a singular and superior breed of fusion architecture and design. Exteriors, interiors, to me. It's an almost schizophrenic blend of whatever novelty could be fabricated by the owner's mind after dabbling in the West, while clinging steadfastly to the ideals of the East. But somehow, it all makes wonderful sense. Ah, oh, that's so cool! It's the same kind of window contraption that my uncle had in his place that he built decades and decades ago in Malaysia. Sorry, I just get so excited about things like this, but now I know that he probably got the idea from China. Or, or did the owner of this diaolo get the idea from Malaysia? It's just so green, isn't it? Walking through here is well, it's a bamboo forest. It's like just minutes and minutes of tranquility, utter peace, bird song, and fresh air. And the great thing is, it's you know, to get to the Diaolong,、um, you have to kind of wind through this little area. 
um, through the villages. So I'm going for a little explore by myself. Really, it's easy to spend hours here roaming from Diaolo to Diaolo. And it's also easy to get lost. But that's all part of the fun. The hard thing is trying not to be impressed. It's a pretty comfortable living space, isn't it? You know, it's so spacious and airy, and it's got so much light coming in during the day. I think I would have really enjoyed living in a place like this. You know, I could bring my entire extended family in here and feel really safe and secure at the same time. And I guess if I was able to build a lift and maybe have some electrical lights in here, <laughs> in a UNESCO listed place, I would probably retire here in style. So you know what? It's almost five o'clock. I think they're closing, so I might have to rush out of here. Like me, you might be wondering what happened to the descendants of the people who built these Diaolo. There'd be nice properties to inherit, wouldn't they? Well, many of them moved abroad permanently and entrusted their Diaolo to the Chinese government, which in turn protected them for the rest of us to enjoy. Coming up next, strolling into an enchanted, forsaken village, and then discovering the other type of lol, not Diao lol, but Qi lol, with the same east-west fusion. Once upon a time, more than 3,000 Diaolo peppered the Jiangmen countryside. Bizarre yet formidable buildings that somehow still sang in tune with the bucolic backdrops of subtropical southern China. They exist nowhere else in the world but here. And no two are the same. There were watchtowers, safe havens and sumptuous mansions, bastions against flooding and thievery, artifacts of history and humanity, ambitions of Chinese abroad, and ultimately, consequences of time. More often than not, you find uncut diamonds when you deviate from the beaten track. Who knows when was the last time these windows were opened? and when the vegetation took over. Not a sound but the birds and raindrops and the gravel under my feet. I find myself wondering, who used to live here? What were their names? Why was this Diaolo built? It's a fairy tale castle floating on an endless sea of jade. An archetypal Diaolo with its cosmopolitan turrets, tall walls, small windows. Where is the key now? The questions only add to the charm. This place is just so cool. You know, there are so many Diaolo here in Kaiping that you could just be wandering through any village and you might stumble across one of them. Now, this village, I think, is a little bit eerie and very magical as well because it's deserted, so there's really no sign of life except for all the shrubbery. But I have noticed some clues as to where the people may have come back from and also where they could have gone. But it's really cool to see that you know, they've le left this part of the legacy behind. We've left Kaiping behind for another county level city in Jiangmen called Taishan. Does this place look familiar? Well, parts of the 2010 action comedy Let the Bullets Fly was filmed here. Anyway, according to some sources, while the population of Taishan is around 950,000, there are more than 1.3 million members of the Taishan diaspora. These blocks reveal a sustained connection between East and West. The Qilo, a style of building where street-level storefronts are uniformly set back two and a half meters to generate sections of continuous covered corridors providing shelter and shade. They're practical and delightful, and really, just a part of everyday life here. 
This area in Taishan is known for having the largest and best preserved chilo, which are these long and narrow structures that are all connected to each other. Now, back in the day, it would have been a lot of commercial activity down the bottom, and the top two floors were for living. And there were also some banks here, so people earning money overseas could send their earnings back home. Well, I guess they all look a little similar in shape and size. But you know what? They're actually all very different in personality, and I think they reflect the owner's own interpretation of fusion architecture. I get some time to ponder as we drive through this prefecture on the western banks of the Pearl River. Frankly, prior to this journey, I had no idea about Jiangmen, the ancestral home of so many overseas Chinese who left behind thousands of these incredible and monumental relics from Qilo to Diaolo. While taking cover from the rain in a small village called Fuyue, still somewhere in Taishan, I meet an old man who graciously invites me to his home. He lives on his own in his recently renovated house, surrounded by sparrow song and faded pictures of his children and their kids. I'm not surprised. It must be a regular narrative here. Left for America. Oh, yeah, my Cantonese isn't great, but I get it eventually. This is the family shrine, you can see, and some old photos, I love old photos. Okay, this time, I don't quite comprehend, but I figure they're his ancestors. And next thing I know, we're upstairs. Oh, he's showing us his awesome balcony. Oh. Oh, I think I finally understand him. So this, this bed he's showing me is 130 years old. It's a real antique, isn't it? Well, such is life here in these parts of Jiangmen. It's a cyclical story of departure and return, of cross-border exchange between traditions and philosophies, and of harmony with nature. After all, where there's water, there's life. The Pearl River system isn't just a widespread web of waterways. It's this huge tangle of history and culture. And here in Jiangmen, the city of overseas Chinese, this history and culture has been significantly influenced by the first generation of Chinese who ventured abroad and left us with a lot of history and also with their legacy. My name's Zui. Catch you next time on Travelogue.